I was talking with a developer friend recently who's brilliant and has used Flexbox for a long time and just has never taken the time to be able to learn Grid or see the power in it. So I thought I'd do this video in part for them, but also for you if you're used to Flexbox and want to kind of figure out what Grid is all about. We're gonna go over the basics of how it works, its defaults, how to customize it, how to lay out a grid, how to control the actual grid container and the children inside of it, along with some more complex topics. You ready? Let's jump in. Hey, what's up? My name is Chris and welcome to Coding in Public. All right, let's start by creating our first grid parent container. I'm gonna do that by adding a class called grid parent like this. This will just be a div. And then inside here, let's have a div itself where we're just gonna add using Emmet something like 15 options here that say one through 15. So these would be the children right inside of here. And right now they're just stacked up, they're all divs. So that means they're all block elements. But if I come over here to this grid parent class and I add display of grid, it looks like nothing changed. So let's first of all talk about some of the defaults you get with grid. And probably the easiest way to show this is by opening up the dev tools. And if I come inside here, you should see right on here, I've now got this little pill for grid. If I click on this, it will show me what's happening. You see how I've got one column and I've got multiple rows. Now, because we're thinking of coming from Flexbox, it can be easy to try to compare grid to Flexbox. While I think that will be helpful as we move through this video, the better comparison is a table because you've got 2D space. You've got multiple different columns and multiple different rows. Now, by default, if you don't specify additional columns, it puts everything in a single column and just stacks it up one after the other. Now for block elements, that stacks it just like this. However, let's go ahead and come back over this way. I'm gonna get rid of this declaration. And if I were to come over here and we had a span that said something like span inside of here, you'll notice that it just takes up the space it needs, right? Well, you can actually see a difference if I come back over here and re-enable grid, you'll notice that this is now neither an inline nor a block element, it's a grid child. All of the direct children become grid children. And by default, they take up the full width of the container and they take up whatever height that they currently need. Now, in this case, the delimiting factor is just the height of the text I have in there. Now, if I didn't have text, these would obviously be a zero height, but they would still take out the full width of the parent container. So those are a few notes about the defaults. Now, one thing you can do is say, hey, instead of adding new items as new rows, I want you to add new items as new columns. And this makes it look a lot more like Flexbox. You do that with a grid auto flow property, and you can set this to column if you want to. Now notice that each only take up the space they need, but eventually they were overflow because I don't have any kind of wrapping system. We can look at this in a little bit when we look at responsiveness. Now, as a whole, I typically leave this just on its default. For me, if I need something with a single row and multiple different columns, that's a perfect use case for Flexbox. So why try to shoehorn grid into that? Now, just as a quick note before we move on to how to create a actual grid system that is multiple columns and multiple grids, you can go ahead and add a gap property. You can do anything here. Let's do like four pixels and you'll notice that it actually adds this spacing here. Clicking on this little grid icon here, you can see how it lays that out for you. But if I get rid of that, you can see the background is now shining through. Now, it used to be that you had to use grid gap. You can now just use gap and gap is also available for Flexbox if you didn't know that. So those are a few notes about the defaults and then also a little bit about how to alter some of those defaults. Next, let's look at how you set up multiple columns. By default, like I said, it has just a single column. You can change that, however, with a grid template columns option. Now here I can set manual values here. So something like 100 pixels, 100 pixels, and it will set up two columns at 100 pixels each. Now notice the order it does this. You see it goes one, two, three, four, right? Just right through one after the other, starting at the top left, moving right, and then starting at the top row and moving down. Now you don't have to use fixed values here. What I could do instead is just say that this needs to be auto and the other one needs to be 100 pixels. So this is a hard coded value. It will be at 100 pixels, whereas this will be auto. That is, it'll take up the rest of the space needed. Now, if you were to have several columns or several rows of the exact same value, you can use the repeat function as well. The repeat takes two options. It takes how many times you want something to repeat. Let's say something like four times and then it takes a value after this. So I could say something like auto. So notice what it's doing. It's taking up the available space and splitting it between these four columns. This will be based on the items, the actual children themselves. Now I could have this as a hard coded value as well. So something like 100 pixels, and that would also work. And notice how that gives me exactly equal columns. There's some complexities here, but generally speaking, this will be the case. Now we can actually do the exact same thing with rows as well. So grid template rows like this, I can actually set this up as 100 pixels as well. And now I've got perfect squares everywhere. I should mention here that there's another value you get with grid that allows you to deal with leftover space. So if I go ahead and move this out, you'll see that I've got all this leftover space over this way. What I could do is come over here and just say, I'm gonna have two separate columns here. This will be one FR and this will be two FR. 
Now, here's what it's doing. It's taking all the available space after my hard-coded values and splitting it up in this way, one fraction and two fractions. Now, if there's no leftover space, it obviously won't have anything to split up. In this case, though, it's got a lot of extra space. But as I slowly move down, you'll notice that it always keeps that ratio going all the way down until finally it locks in at whatever the minimum value can be left to right or in line. Those fractional units can be very helpful, but it, you have to remember that it's dealing with leftover space. All right, with that said, let me go ahead and get rid of this right here. We're going to leave it just like this. Now what we have is a grid parent, that's all this right here, that has four columns and four rows. Now notice inside of here, we've got these children. And right now, these children do not have their own width and height. They are simply filling the entire grid cell that they have. Again, the comparison here is with an HTML table. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these rows here. We're just going to set the height here to 100 view height. Now you'll notice that the grid children take on the height of the container. So in this case, when it takes 100 view height and splits it up between the different rows it has available, now that it's auto kind of incrementing those rows, they're each at 82.38 pixels. Now let's talk about what happens when you have a grid child that has its own width or height. So if I come over here, let's go ahead and add a height here. We'll do something like, I don't know, 50 pixels. And you'll notice that by default, in each of the grid cells, the items only take up the top and left section that they need. So if I set a width, we did something like 80 pixels, I should get some space on the right. So next, let's talk about positioning those items. There's two things we need to think about. One is the content and the other are the items. Now the content refers to the entire grid right here, the parent itself. Where do you want it to sit in its own container? Now the container in this case is the entire main tag. So in this case, let's say I want this to be in the center of the screen. Well, I could use something called justify content and I could set this to center. This is gonna look a lot like Flexbox. Notice the entire grid, the parent itself, is moving to the center if it's available container. And obviously, as I were to move the viewport and change it around, it stays in the very center. Now, just like Flexbox, you have a lot of these same options. So you have space around and space between and lots of different options like this. Again, this has to deal with the container itself. The same thing works for align. So if I take align content, I've got a lot of these same options. I've got things like center. I've got things like end. In this case, we wouldn't use flex end, just end itself. And notice how it shoves it all the way down to the bottom section of its container. So I can combine these with justify content and we can say center. And then the entire container is at the bottom center section that it needs to take up. So that's dealing with the grid itself. Next, let's talk about positioning the individual items inside of that. So you can see here, if I remove those declarations, it just takes up all the space it can within its parent. So how do we move these internal items inside their cells? Well, I can use a different option. This would not be content. Now we're looking at the individual items. So let's use something like, first of all, a line items. And it's the same axes we just looked at. Now we're talking about the individual items, those numbers or those spans inside of their cells. We could use something like center and notice how it puts it vertically in the center of its cell. Obviously, as the cell changes sizes, that will also change where it's positioned. So if I were to move this up, you'll notice that now it actually squishes a little bit, but it always tries to stay in the center. I've got the same options here for justify items. And once again, I can do something like center. Now with either the content or the items, you can combine these values if you want to and use place items or place content and use something like center. This will both align item center and justify items center. So it's always items for the cells and content for the entire parent. That means sometimes you might have items in the center like this, and you might also say place content in the center. This would put the entire grid in the center of the screen, and then inside of each of those cells, the children would be in the center of their sections. And notice how it gets rid of any additional space. And the declaration that does that is this place content because it's the parent itself saying, hey, I want all of my stuff to be in the very center of the screen. So we've looked at some defaults. We looked at how to lay out a grid. We've also looked how to move around the grid and sub items inside of the grid inside of their cells. Finally, I want to talk a little bit more about positioning these items exactly where you want them. So to do that, I'm going to get rid of this declaration right here. And then let's jump back over this way. And I'm going to get rid of a couple more of these. So now you can see we've got some empty cells. So let's go ahead and come over here and I'm gonna select individual items here. In this case, let's just worry about the span. So I've got just a single span. Let's come in here and I'm gonna position this wherever I want it to be. Now you've got a couple of options here where you can actually select the beginning row and column and the ending row and ending column. So first of all, let's look at grid row. This grid row you declare with two different options. First of all, the very first line, that would be right over here. You'll notice I even get these nice numbers here. You can get this in the styles tab if you don't see that. And up here, let's see if I can see this. Actually, I think it's the layout tab right here. 
You can say grid names, grid sizes, track lines. There's a bunch of different options here, depending on what your use case is. Right now we're gonna keep it real simple and let's go ahead and show this again so you can see this. So we're starting with the starting value we want it to start at and the ending value we want it to start at. So in this case, I do something like one and three and notice that the span takes up, oh, I'm looking at grid row. Let's look at grid column right here. And you'll notice that it takes up one, two, three. Now look what happens with the additional items. They simply move over to the next cell available, first to the right, and then wrapping around down below. Now we can do the same thing if we want to with a span declaration. So if I say something like span three, notice that it now can span three different columns. Now, as I already showed you accidentally, if I come down here, I can change the row as well, and it will now span three rows and span three columns. Now, one thing to note, because I actually have a height and width on each of these, it's not filling the whole section like it typically would. And then I also have this place item center, which is putting them each in the individual section in the center of whatever their cell happens to be. Now for the span, the cell is actually nine cells, right? It actually should be right here in the middle. Now, why is this up to the left? Well, notice first of all that the entire background is there. So if I get rid of this right here, you'll see the entire background is here, which means the entire child is filling that space. However, the individual item inside of it is not. And that's because when you're working with grid, it's only the direct children that are affected. Now there is something called subgrid that is now working its way finally into browsers where you can control the sub children by a subgrid property. We're not gonna get into that in this video, but if you're interested in that, let me know. So there's a couple different things I can do. First of all, I can just take all the individual children and set display grid here and set these to place items on center like this. So those nodes, the text nodes are now grid children and I can put them in the center just like this. So whether you're using the span like this, or you're using the values like one to three, you can set this up however it works best for you. Now, if you know what you want for both of these, you could use something called a grid area. This is just another shorthand. Now this takes four values. It takes a starting row, then it takes a starting column, then it takes an ending row, and then finally it takes an ending column. So let's set this up using the same kind of thinking. We'd go one, one, so this is my first row, my first column, down to three, and maybe something like four for the final one. And notice it takes up that whole space. Now, again, it's actually the lines that matter here. So I'm not spanning four in this case, I'm going from line one, which would be right here, all the way to line four. So I'm going over three cells and four lines. Same thing here with the rows. I'm starting at row one, going to line two, and finally down to line three. Now, I wanna show just one other thing, and so I'm gonna copy this down, and we're gonna add simply whatever the next sibling element is. And notice that as soon as I do that, and I save it here, it actually overlaps the other span entirely. And just to show that, if I came over here and did something like an opacity of like 0.5, you'll notice that the span is actually behind that. So you can overlay these however you need to. That means if I wanted to, I could come over here and set this at like three, and that means this is just right here, and the span fills the entire section. So this can be really helpful when you used to use something like position absolute to do this, but instead you can actually lay out grids very specifically. Now, what if you say, I don't wanna add all these different numbers everywhere? Well, you can replace these if you want to by something like div one. Well, this is a name you're going to give it that corresponds to the actual element itself. Now, because I want this to be the case for a lot of these different elements, let me jump back over this way. Let's get rid of a lot of these. So I'll just have four left. And since I already have something for the span, let me just come over here. I'm gonna add a class for each of these. We'll do something like child, and then I'll just do text pastry, and I'll do one through four. Okay, so that's just a little extension that gives me those different values. So I've got the span now and four children. So let's move back over this way. And here I'm gonna do child one, and let's copy this down. And we'll do two, three, and four. Now, since I haven't told this where to be, it's putting them all down here in this final section. What I wanna do is give this an actual direction. So I've given it a name so far. They actually all have the same name, so I need to give these things different names like this. And then let's go ahead and give this thing a name too. So of course you would probably want to name these a little bit more descriptively, but for our purposes, this should work. So here we've got four columns laid out, but what I want to add on top of this is something called a grid template area. Now the only reason I'm keeping the columns there is so that they each stay hundred pixels wide. Now what I want to do is delineate what these things should look like. Now to start with, I usually like to fill these in with just empty periods. If I add these inside of quotation marks and then copy this down a few times, you'll notice it actually lays this thing out for me. So what I can do is come inside here and replace any of these, which would be blank areas by default, with one of my grid names. So I could say span one, span one, and span one would all fit up there. And notice how it fits into that section. Now because I haven't named or put these other ones, the div one, div two, and div three, it's not sure what to do with those, but I could, for instance, come over here and say something like div one, div one, and then maybe here I'd say there's a blank, and then there's div two, 
But notice I can actually span different rows as well. So I could have the div two come down here as well. And maybe I have div three go from here to here and we leave a blank spot at the beginning. And I'll space this out in a second, but finally let's grab div four. And let's just say that this spans all the way across. Now, once I have this set up, you see it's actually working, but I find it easier if I can just space these things all out the exact same. So through the magic of editing, you can see I just align those columns and now it's a lot easier to see exactly what's in each column and in each row. And notice what we've got here. We've got this as an empty space in my grid and that means it's just transparent. There's nothing there. Same thing over here. And then I can actually span these items wherever I want to. Now that makes it really easy to do these kind of masonry layouts where you have specific items that need to go in specific places. What makes this even better is when you have different media queries. So if I were to come down here and I add a media query, like whenever it's minimum of 500 pixels, I can change this up. So let's redeclare this grid parent. I'm gonna get rid of all these other things like this, and I could just rearrange these however I want. I can even move things entirely. So let's say I have my grid div two now up here, div one here, and I'll have my div three over here. Now notice here on any screen above 500 pixels, and now it takes on a two column grid where I've completely moved around the items. Now if I reshow the elements, you'll notice I've actually got two unused columns. That's because of the declaration I have right up here. So this might also be something I wanna rewrite here, or I just say now I want 200, two of these, and we could set them to something like 400 each. So now I simply have two columns. Now as I make this screen smaller, so let's make this responsive like this, I will eventually get under 500 pixels and notice I've got my four columns back. So this makes it really easy for working with responsive design. Now, speaking of responsive design, as somebody who works with Flexbox, you probably have a very basic use case in mind. Let's get rid of all these right here. And I'm also gonna get rid of these grid template areas as well. Finally, just so we don't have to worry about these names, I'm gonna get rid of these as well because right now it doesn't know what to do with these. And I'm gonna come back up top and talk about what happens if you want these to just to wrap as they need to. Right now, I've got four columns of 100 pixels wide. And if I make my screen smaller, you'll notice it just overflows. So is there a way to have this auto wrap like you would expect in something like Flexbox? Well, there is, and once again, you've got a new function available to you. You can use the repeat, and then you've got both auto fill and auto fit. Auto fit will fill whatever columns there are into that space. So it tries to expand and fill columns rather than leave empty columns. Auto fit just fits as many as possible on a row, even if they're empty. So in this case, I'm gonna use auto fit, then I'm gonna use the min max function, to pass it the minimum, which would be something like 100 pixels, and the maximum, which we are gonna use one of our fractional units. So I could say something like one fraction. Now what this will do is set up equal columns as much as it can. When it gets below 100 pixels, it will wrap one down below. So as you can see, as I move here, it just starts to wrap these just like you would expect. Now it moves it down just one at a time so that as I change sizes here, when it's available, it allows me to have more. That means when I get down to the small screen here, it actually stacks them all into one single column. Now we've really just scratched the surface of what's available in Grid. The most valuable developer can reach for Grid or Flexbox depending on the situation. There's lots of times when Flexbox is actually the better choice and lots of other times where I prefer to use Grid. I hope that was a big help in understanding the value of Grid, along with kind of explaining some of how you actually use it. Having all these individual tools means you can reach for Flexbox when you need it and Grid when you need it, always choosing the most optimized solution. If you're interested in when I would choose Grid over Flexbox, let me know and I'll try to put a video together on that. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Happy coding.